So, Edward, you directed all five episodes of the Showtime limited series, Patrick Melrose. Um, take us back to the beginning. What about this uh, story spoke to you and made you want to helm all five hours of it? Well, uh, basically, these, this show, these scripts landing in my lap was the biggest luck of my life. Uh, I read the first book in 1993, I think. I was in New York. I stumbled into the St. Mark's bookstore, and I found a, an, I think what it was, an illegal import or some kind of import into the U.S. because it hadn't found a publisher there yet until, I think, until 2000 or something, or two, early 2000s. And so I found the first book, and I just loved the the script and uh, I loved the book and I just totally fell in love with that world. So when I heard that this was being made and that I was, you know, I just raised my hand and said, I want to do this. These are, you know, one of my favorite books ever written and uh, the, one of the fav my favorite characters or most interesting characters. So I just wanted to do it. Well, I'm curious. I mean, since you had read the book uh, all that time ago, uh, when you first read it, was it something that immediately jumped out at you as, as lending itself uh, to a, uh, a television adaptation, a cinematic adaptation? Um, was it on the page? Did it, did it seem like it would be something good to adapt? Absolutely not. And I'd actually, um, you know, so I'm very, very pleased that Michael and Rachel and, and the two executive producers and David Nichols took this upon them to develop this because it's very difficult to adapt. Basically, not much happens. You know, it doesn't, it's not in terms of a traditional plot. There's very little in it. It's about one man and his psychological dismay and him falling apart and schizophrenia and all these voices in his head. So it's very hard to visualize and make it, you know, a, 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 you know pe make people want to watch it because it's, it's actually quite tough material. And basically, you have to endure the qualms of one character. Um, uh, let me turn this off. Uh, the qualms of one character, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, going through life for forty years, and so it's very hard to to make that work. And I think when I read the scripts, I was so um, blown away how I had how David had made it work and adapted it to into scripts. What can you tell us? I mean, what did David Nichols do right that um, made it uh, a worthy adaptation? Well, he took basically the essence of each book and made each book, um, you know, f feel like a, a 60 minute film with a plot, even though uh, Patrick Melrose just runs through New York in the 80s trying to score drugs. You know, it's basically the same thing over and over again, but little variations and him going crazier and crazier and being closer and closer to the edge. So it just felt, you know, each time it felt new. It, each time when he turned the corner, everything felt new. And so, and he also made it funny, even though it's so dark, he made it. And then I, I was actually writing myself on a script at the time. And when I read David's adaptation, I put the script aside and said, why do I even bother? He's much better, you know, he should just write. And I just should direct, you know, I don't want to write. And then, uh, I, I picked up the books again, and I realized a lot of the dialogue, a lot of very, very sarcastic, sardonic, evil, dark, funnily evil dialogue is actually in the books. So David, I was kind of relieved that not all the, all the great work came from one person, but there were actually two great writers involved. So I said, all right, it was two people. So I was, I was kind of relieved that it wasn't just one person who made all this up. And um, so I was reminded of, 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 of Edwards and Auburn's great work while rereading the books. But basically, you know, the magic of it was make, putting, you know, condensing each book into one film, into one 60 minute film. And then the great idea was also, but I think this came together with Showtime and Sky also, just to switch the order of the books, just to put the second book first and start with, not a six-year-old kid in the south of France and do it chronologically, which would be the first book, but to start with Patrick Melrose in his 20s, played by Benedict Cumberbatch, being crazy. And that gave me the feeling as an audience, as a first reader, oh, what happened to this man? What's, you know, I want to find out more about him. Why is he so crazy? What's wrong with him? What happened to him? And so we only slowly reveal it throughout this series to uh, you know what what the background of this man is. So I thought it was a very very good 
device to get us hooked into a dramatic device. Right. Um, since it so intimately follows the life of this one character, I'm curious, as a, as a director, was there something about him that you saw yourself in? Or if not, was that part of the challenge to, to find a way to uh, really explore this guy's psychology? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, when I first started, I, the first thing I did was have dinner with um, uh, Teddy Sinorbin. Edward Sinorbin, the original writer. And um, we basically, I asked him, what do you want the audience to feel? What do you want them to take away from the experience of this movie uh, when, or, you know, these five hours when they watch it? And uh, he said that, you know, he thought for a second and said, well, I think liberation from the chains of our past. And some of us have a bigger baggage to carry, like he does, and some of us don't. But still, all of us sort of have to liberate ourselves and, you know, get away from, from you know, what we grew up with. And so that's, I think, that's very identifiable with everyone and certainly with me. So, uh, so you know, that's what I latched onto. I spoke with your composer recently, Volker uh, Bertelman, mm -hmm. and he said that one of the things that really appealed to him about working on it was the fact that each episode was so unique uh, mm -hmm. in its style and in, in its uh, approach. Uh, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I, it felt to me, you know, when reading the books actually, and the scripts, you read the books and the scripts and you think they all feel different. You know, suddenly the first one feels very subjective in Patrick Melrose's mind, behind him, going with him in this manic pace through New York, frantic, schizophrenic, shattered, splintered apart. You know, so it's very, it felt very quick and fast and, and subjective, trying to get into this person's head and, you know, um, uh, you, know, you know, basically identifying with him and trying to live through his plight. And so I wanted to shoot it that way, just be always behind him, in his face, be basically show everything through Patrick Melrose or on his face and f show very little else. Um, um, you know, there was a movie made called Son of Saul, which did that uh, brilliantly. So that was kind of a role model, I thought. You know, if we can pull that off to have an, uh, 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 an experience this subjective, that would be the ultimate goal. Uh, the second film suddenly felt, you know, when reading it, felt very objective. We stepped back in time and perspective. It wasn't Benedict's or Patrick's perspective anymore. It was, was sort of an outside view. Almost felt like a very analytical experiment, an architecture, a Michael Haneke movie almost. And so we, I took that as a role model and thought, you know, we're looking at the social experiment of this evil man in southern France terrorizing his family and all his friends. So I took a step back with the camera and just looked at it and felt it's enough if I observe everything and let it play out in front of the camera without manipulating it too much. Um, it also felt, you know, 1960s, I thought a good thing would be to only use technological things that were available at the time, you know, not, you know, have wider framing, not move too much, be very static actually. Um, so it, it just felt like a different, you know, different atmosphere. And the last, and, and the third film, you know, we jump on 10 years in Patrick Melrose's life from the first episode. He's sober, he's in a different state of mind, he's in a different period of his life. Psychologically, he's moved on. So I, um, you know, I, I, I thought it should be more fluid. And we took the Steadicam a lot and did like four or five minute takes going through the crowd from one person to the next connecting everything and just feel a bit more fluid while still being haunted. And slowly, 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 we try to normalize everything and come to a normal, slower pace with Patrick, you know, stepping out into, you know, taking one step towards normalcy or the first step towards normalcy at the end of the series, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, given how uh, disparate all of those visual approaches are that you just described, what are some ways that you link them uh, so that, I mean, they are all a part of this one man's story and so that they don't feel as though they are just kind of all over the place stylistically? Mm -hmm. um, well, 
Well, the first thing that links him is uh, is Benedict Cumberbatch uh, and the character. That helps. And, you know, <laughs> by by you know having the same character, you said it. You know, it, it's linked automatically. And I, as an audience, I want to go through life with this character and. And I meet him in different psychological states, 10 years, 20 years apart from each other. So it's automatically linked. And I make that journey with him. And I think, you know, a certain style we try to, you know, I like to, you know, centralize the camera. I try to keep the camera concentrated on the actors. I tend to not overuse music. You know, I'm, it's still me making it with the same crew, with the same cameraman, with the same production designer the same costume designer and makeup artist. So we all shape that series. We can't get away from ourselves. So hopefully that's a, that's a, a little bit of a link that we, that we created. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, the whole thing pretty much rests on his uh, very capable shoulders. So mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a bit about why he was the perfect Patrick Melrose and what that uh, working relationship was like between the two of you? Um, well, the first description in the book is it says like there's a vampiric, sallow person, uh, you know, coming down the hallway, skinny, tall, lanky, and the first person you think of is Benedict Cumberbatch, you know, just by the physical description of that character in the book, and you, um, yeah, you, 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 I just you just imagine him immediately, also his inventiveness. His immense energy, his immense, you know, awakeness, uh, you know, being awake, being experimental, being, you know, having million thoughts at once in his head is very perfect for that uh, very frantic Patrick Melrose character. And um, our working relationship was just fabulous. You know, we, we, we worked on it together. You know, he came in the morning. He didn't have a preconceived idea you know he knew what what he was going to do or he, he knows what he's doing anyway but he tries to experiment he doesn't come with one set mind and say this is the way i'm going to play it but he comes in trying things out in a million different ways and we did a lot of the times we did six seven eight takes and just doing them differently each one different uh and leaving it up to the edit to decide what works best and was actually fascinating to find out if you use Different takes for the entire film, especially for episode one, for bad news, you get a completely different film and a completely different feeling. So I believe through his, you know, offering, you know, giving us the gift of, of all these varieties, slower, faster, more desperate, funnier, uh, you know, we had a ability, a possibility to shape the film uh, in the end. And we could have made a very different film. It was only one combination that made it what it is now. And you can completely, you could have completely made it differently uh, alone through Benedict's performance. So I was very grateful for having that variety and that gift in, 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 in what he did. You also have a lot of great actors who surround him, uh, including Jennifer Jason Lee and, and Hugo Weaving as his parents. Can you talk a bit about working with them? Because I mean, it's, they're the type of roles that can so easily uh, become stereotypes you know, uh, the the parents who uh, abused the troubled child who became a troubled adult. So can you talk a bit about working with the two of them? Yes. Um, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee is just same thing, you know, very gracious, very, um, you know, just a wonderful actress to work with. Just, uh, um, you know, very, also, she likes the experience. She's very quiet on the set and very concentrated, very much in her role. And it was, it's wonderful to see how different everyone is. And Hugo has this immense aura, this presence, a real Australian man. You know, you look up to him and go like, whoa. You know, and he has this confidence and he just sits at the table and can take his time with his lines. And because he knows everyone's listening anyway to what he has to say. He's just very charismatic and enigmatic. And so he's perfect for that role. And I, I really love how he as an Australian, you know, took that Englishness of that role. I mean, he's a, he's, he's, he's a Brit as well. He has a British passport. But he made that Englishness work wonderfully and beautifully. 
I wanted to make a fact, fact that, uh, that uh, same year same you year. also directed three episodes of The Terror, uh, which is a totally <laughs> different yeah. kind of, uh, of story from this one. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a bit about your experiences working on a show that was on such a massive uh, scale as, as that one was. I'm sorry, it dropped out for a second. Um, I, if, if I can talk a little bit about the terror. Yeah, just as, I mean, it's such a, a different kind of show. I'm curious yeah. to talk a bit about your experiences there. Well, you know, I've, first and foremost, I was attracted to the characters and the story and the terror. And, you know, I read the script and I thought, wow, this is brilliant. You know, what a great story, what a great idea. And I thought, you know, I don't know how to do this. I have no clue how to shoot this, especially in a studio. I've never done something like that. And, you know, I like to be, you know, surprised by the stories. I like to surprise myself from what I do. And I like a good challenge. I like to know, I like to go into a film and not know what, what it's going to be. And it could be a complete failure in the end. I just think, you know, you know, the possibility of failure is, is really important to stay awake, to stay eager, to really make do the best possible work because no one wants to fail. You really want to make a great movie, but I want to be afraid that it could turn out terribly. You know? And so I like the idea of challenging myself and always finding new material that I haven't done before. So I did the terror, which I hadn't done before, and I did something completely different, Patrick Melrose, which is just the opposite. And I just like that idea of always finding something new that keeps me on the edge, that keeps me awake, that keeps me changing, it keeps me developing and finding new uh, uh, kinds of languages for, um, uh, for you know, making films. Well, Edward, thank well, you Edward, so thank much. You and so much. Uh, congratulations on your work on Patrick Melrose as well as The Terror and uh, everything else that you're uh, working on now. Appreciate the thank time. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you.